But somewhere in that time, this was a long trip to walk. This wasn't a short distance. It was going to take a little while, and we know that it was getting toward the evening. It was getting late, and no doubt they had so many things going through their mind. They were confused. They was, should have been a little bit hopeful. It doesn't appear that they were at first, but you know, Jesus had told them, I'm going to die on the cross, and on the third day, I'm going to rise again. But when he did rise again, everybody was confused, and they were sad. But it, it, it took him rising again on that third day, and they were sad. But here in just a few verses, they was going to be very happy about it when they finally understood what was going on. And so the Bible tells us in verse 14, And they talked together of all these things which had happened. I believe it's important that when things happen in our life that we talk with our brothers and sisters in Christ and we share the good things in our life and we share the bad things as well and we help one another and that we be there for one another because the Bible tells us we're to strengthen our brethren and we're to mourn with those that mourn and to weep with those that weep. If, you're, if your brother and sister in Christ, if they're having a hard time and they're sad and they're praying about something because they have a need in their life, you ought to be sad and pray with them. And so they're beginning to talk about all these things that have happened and trying to find something in this that's going to make them feel better. And the Bible tells us, and it came to pass, that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him, Jesus himself. I mean, Jesus had just rose again on this third day. The tomb was empty, and nobody could find him. And here comes Jesus himself. And he walks up, but they don't recognize him because they're so focused on their troubles. They're so focused on how sad they are and in their self-pity. And because they haven't realized that exactly what Jesus had told them, that's what's happened. That was his plan. And he told them it had to happen, and it was going to be a great thing, but they were sad. And because they were so focused on the things in their life, they wouldn't have in their eyes on him. They wouldn't look and get him closely enough. They wouldn't where they should have been, so they began to miss out when Christ himself was walking with them. I believe it's important that we keep our eyes on him and that we begin to, to get close to God and stay where we need to be because if we aren't careful, we'll get so focused on our job. We'll get so focused on the things of the world that really in the end, they don't even matter. We'll get so focused on our bank account and trying to make a dollar. Or we'll focus on that game that really didn't turn out how we wanted it to turn out. And we'll pout about that for seven or eight days. Or, or we'll get focused on something that's not church related. And when Christ is in us and he's trying to, we're trying to have revival and we're trying to, to get closer to him, Satan, he creeps in. And he gets your eyes on things they shouldn't be on. And so here you are, you have Jesus Christ on the very inside of you, but we don't even realize that half the time, and when he's trying to fellowship with us, we have our eyes somewhere else. Amen. And they were about to miss out on a few things because they didn't realize it quick enough. Now, thank God in the end, they did realize it, and they did get some blessings out of it, but if they would have been focused on him when he walked up, it would have been a lot better of a trip on the way to Emmaus. But the Bible says in verse 17, And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them whose name was Cleopas answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? Cleopas wasn't making a smart aleck remark, but he's, he was saying, you must not be from around here. Because the past few days, all the talk has been about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And how ironic this was that they're saying, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? And this is the very man who hung on the cross three days ago. Of course he knew everything about it. He's the one that died and rose again. But they were focused on their thing. They didn't have their eyes in the right place. And so Jesus himself asked, what things? I find that very interesting. The man who hung on the cross and gave every last drop of blood was the very reason they were sad, was the one who rose again and they found the tomb empty this same morning. He said, what things? As if he didn't know. See, he wanted them to tell him what was wrong. Jesus knows every single thing in your life. He knows every single thing you're going through. He knows how he's going to fix it. He's not wringing his hands and wiping the sweat 
off his brow up in heaven wondering how he's going to fix your problems. But he does want you to come to him and acknowledge what's going on in your life and acknowledge that you need help and turn it all over to him. The Bible says ye have not because ye ask not. If we'll acknowledge that we need help and we acknowledge that we're going to have to have him to make it through this, that's when things will start to get good. But if we sit around in our self-pity and we try to take care of it on our own, we don't want to talk to the Lord about it. It might not be so good as it, as it, gets toward, as it progresses toward the end. But the Bible tells us here, And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. They had been taught that when the Messiah would come, that the earthly kingdom would be set up right then and there. And they had trusted in this, and they had put their faith in this. And so when it didn't happen, they began to be sad. But if they had just listened to Jesus here, because if you look earlier in this chapter, the Bible tells us in verse 8, when it was talking about the, the resurrection, it says, and they remembered his words. If they would have remembered all of his words, they'd have known this was going to happen, but they had their faith in the wrong thing, and they said, well, we thought this is how it was going to be. And one of the most... One of the hardest things you'll ever deal with in your life is when you get a situation going on in your head. I mean, you, you get so involved in this situation, and you begin to think about it and determine how it's going to play out yourself. You, you, don't think, you don't think about how the Lord wants it to turn out. You don't say, Lord, your will be done. You say, I want it to happen like this, and at this time, on this day, and I want so-and-so to be there. And you have in your head over days and over weeks just how this situation you're in that you're worried about how it's going to turn out. But then when it doesn't go like you think it ought to, instead of just turning it all over to God, which is what we should have done to begin with, we begin to get sad about it because we put our faith and our trust in something that didn't happen. When if we just say, Lord, your will be done, and I know you're going to take care of this, we'd be much better off. So we see here that they begin to walk and talk, and they, they begin to uh, tell him what had happened that morning at the sepulcher. And the Bible tells us here in verse 25, it says, Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not to, or ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see, they still don't know just yet that this is Jesus Christ himself, but he begins to expound in the scriptures. Now, he was just as much God as he was man. But to comfort them, he expounds on the scriptures. He could have picked up a rock and turned it to bread. He could have made a clearing in the roadway and have water run through it and say, look, look, don't you see it's me? Look at the power I have. Don't you remember? But you know what he did? He expounded in the scriptures to comfort them. He didn't perform some great miracle. He went to his word. You know how he comforts me and you in the year 2022? If we'll get in his word and we'll read about what he says and we'll read about what he's told us and we'll remember his word, we'll have some comfort. Instead of looking for a great earthquake or some sign in the clouds. If we're just getting his word, see, that's how he's always comforted people. He performed miracles and helped people because he was constantly going about helping people. But when it comes to comforting them, he went to the scripture. And the same thing they had 2,000 years ago when Christ was walking the earth, me and you still have it today. That's amazing. That ought to excite us. That, that ought to make us want to get in His Word. And so they tell us in verse 28, And they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, and He made as though He would have gone further. But they constrained Him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And He went in to tarry with them. 
So he began to act as if he's just going to keep on walking as they begin to approach their house here. And he's going to see what they're going to do. And mind you, had they not constrained him, he would have kept walking and just kept on going. You see, when Christ is fellowshipping with us and when he has his presence in our life and he's talking with us, we've got to constrain him to abide with us. I don't know how they constrained him. I find that very interesting, but they said, no, 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 no. I don't know. We, we don't know everything yet about what you're talking about, but we know we like it a whole lot, and we want to know some more about it. So why don't you just come home with us? You know, that's, that's what we need to do in the, the United States of America in our day. We ought to get Christ back in the home. Everybody wants to wonder why things are in such a bad shape throughout the world in our country. We've kicked Christ out of the home, and we've kicked him out of the school, and we've kicked him out of the government, and in a lot of places, they've kicked him out of the church, or a so-called church, if you will. You'd be surprised at how well things would get if we just put Christ back in the home and let him lead it like he's supposed to. You show me a home where Christ is leading, and I'll show you a home that's doing very well. It said, abide with us. And it came to pass, as he said, it meet with them. He took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. Now, Jesus is in their house. And they begin to eat, and no doubt they've had this long journey. I mean, they've went, you know, two to three hours of walking. They want something to eat. And so the Bible tells us here that he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. Everything we have is God's. He's letting us borrow it. So if he's letting us borrow these things, or he's giving these things, when in the end they're really his anyways, and when we're dead and gone, they're going to go to somebody else, so we ought not to get too caught up in them. But he's given us everything that we have. I mean, the house that you live in, he grew that wood. The air you're breathing, he made that. And so the Bible says that he took the bread. And in order to give something, you have to have possession of it. Well, I read here that the Bible tells us he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. So it was God's to begin with, and then he gave it to these disciples. But now Jesus has it in his possession again, which tells me they gave it back to, back to Jesus. And so what does Jesus do? He gives it to them again. If we will acknowledge that what we have is God's and it's, it's all His anyways and it's not ours and He's just letting us borrow it, if we'll turn it all over to Him and say, Lord, do what you want to with it, He might just bless us some more. And He gave thanks for it too. I believe if Jesus Christ can give thanks, I think we can give thanks. There's so many people in our day that are unthankful. We have more than we've ever had and people act like they simply don't care. I mean, the weather is an absolute mess today, but yet we have this nice facility. It's warm in here, and we have electricity, and we have this nice place to worship. But yet the churches are emptier now than they've ever been. It says, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, right at the very end, they was able to see him. They finally got their eyes where they needed to be, but he disappeared. They said, did our heart not burn within us? That's a good kind of heartburn right there. I th I'd like to have some more of that. But we see here, as while he opened to us the scriptures, I'm glad that when I come to church and I hear somebody preach out of this old book here, this King James Version Bible, and if, you, if you're somewhere where they ain't preaching the King James Version Bible, the best thing you can do is get up and go somewhere where they are. But I'm glad that when I hear somebody preach out of this old book, or when I open it up myself and I begin to read through the scriptures, I feel something on the inside of me and it begins to stir. And I can't even put it into words, but I do know it's better felt than told. And if you can't feel it, you need to get to where you can. Because it's something that'll last. 
when you have some living water, when you get a drink of that, you won't be out in the world looking for anything else. It, it'll satisfy you. You won't have to spend every dime you got trying to get something to make you happy. What, what Jesus has to offer, it's absolutely free. It's a gift. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to work to keep it. All you have to do is accept it. I'm, I'm glad that I can feel it on the inside of me. But the Bible tells us here, And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. You see, in verse 12, we know that they were still at the sepulcher. They were still at the tomb. And so it goes immediately in to these two disciples here in this trip. And it appears they're the first to see him, or one of the first to see him. And so when they realize what has happened, I mean, when they realize they just walked and talked for a few hours, and he came in their house with the very man that died on the cross, they said, we've got to go back and tell everybody. We've got to go back and let the others know so they don't stay the whole night acting the same way we were. And so they pick up and they take off back to Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, but I, I like to think that that trip to Jerusalem from Emmaus was a lot happier and a lot quicker than the one from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Because they had something to tell. They was excited. and You know, for all I know, that they may have been running them 60 furlongs. So we've got to go tell everybody else. I'm thankful for God bringing me this far. And I'm thankful that he's going to carry me home. Don't have to wonder about it. Don't have to question it. Don't have to second guess it. You know, sometimes my faith gets weak. And if you'll be honest, yours does too. All of ours do. We're, we're human. I mean, we're, we're just people. Y your faith is going to get weak from time to time. And that includes the preacher. He needs prayer because he doesn't get a pass from the devil because he's a preacher. That just puts a bigger target on his back. And so I, I, I get down sometimes with my faith. It, it decreases a little bit, and I have so much going on, being full-time in, in work and in school. And, you know, my grandma's not doing all that good, and I've had something I've dealt with for a few years now that, it's just, it's really, it, it can be frustrating sometimes. And I began to think about, Lord, why is it turning out this way? But then when I remember that it's his plan, not mine, and that he's leading me through it, and that he's walking along with me the whole way, even if I don't always realize it, it begins to get pretty good. And so I have to go tell everybody what the Lord's done for me. I have to tell everybody how good he's been to me. But you know what? The Bible tells us here in verse 35, and they told what things were done in the way and how we was known of them in the breaking of bread. But in verse 34, it says, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to some. They got back and they said, Y'all aren't going to believe it. He's alive. He's risen. The tomb is empty. We just walked and talked with him. I mean, we was with him. He, he helped us out. He, he made us happy. He took away our sadness. And they said, we know because he's been with us too. He's been with Simon. Mary's seen him. I'm glad he has time for everybody. I'm glad that when I come to church or when I see you out in town somewhere and I begin to tell you about the things that Christ has done with me, I'm glad that you can turn around and tell me about the things he's done for you. I believe this was a trip that changed something. I'm going about telling what Jesus had done. So I'd like to ask you this morning, are you headed toward Emmaus? Are you headed toward Jerusalem? Because if you're heading toward Emmaus, you may need to get your eyes right and head back toward Jerusalem. I'm glad that when I got right with Christ, when I got saved, when I got born again, when I got some living water, he put me on the road to the new Jerusalem. And I'm still on that road. And it's a lot happier and a lot better than that road to Emmaus when I was sad and down. I didn't know how things was going to turn out. If you're not walking with him this morning, I'd advise you to accept him. It's free. It's a gift. If he's speaking to you this morning, you know who you are. I don't have to tap you on the shoulder and tell you, hey, it's you. You already know. 
because your heart is burning within you. If you want to come pray this morning, I'd be happy to pray with you. Your pastor would be happy to pray with you. This church would be happy to pray with you. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. It's not worth going to hell over. If the Lord's speaking to you this morning and you need to get things right, you need to come and be saved. You may just want to get closer to Him. You just may want to get your eyes fixed this morning for the week of revival so, so we can have revival like we need to and not just go through the motions and do it halfway. Where are your eyes? Are they on Him? You may need to readjust them. Is your heart burning within you? Come get it right. If you would stand, come to the song of invitation. You can sing when you get ready. Brother Micah, you can turn it out, or you can close it out however you see fit.